While legislation to prevent sexual harassment has stalled in Congress, the Washington Post reports state houses have been doing something about it. Amber Phillips is a reporter for The Fix at The Washington Post. She joins me now from Washington. All right, so Amber, what kinds of changes have state legislatures been making when it comes to workplace misconduct? Yeah, Elaine, they are basically dusting off rules that they had on the books uh, for decades and probably no one until now has looked at and saying, how can we make this easier for uh, victims of people in power in state legislatures to report potential sexual misconduct. So a couple states have set up hotlines. Other states have set up commissions to sort of rework their whole uh, their whole rule book for sexual harassment. Um, and at least one state, New Mexico, has set up what I can best describe as like a flow chart to say, OK, uh, if you're a staffer and you feel like you've been uh, sexually harassed by a lobbyist, here's what you do and who you call. If you're a lobbyist and you feel like a lawmaker did something to you, here's what you do and here's who you call. So it, it's a mix of things that basically sum up to updating really dusty policies. Wow. Well, has the number, Amber, of sexual harassment scandals on the state level been similar to the amount on Capitol Hill? I think so in terms of volume. Of course, it's not apples to apples because there are hundreds more state lawmakers than there are members of Congress. Uh, but basically, it comes down to a lot of lawmakers have been accused of sexual harassment, both in Congress and at the state level. Um, an AP investigation earlier this year found two dozen lawmakers across the country in state legislatures had resigned because of sexual harassment. At least two chambers had to force out members, I believe that was Arizona and Colorado, wow. who wouldn't go over accusations. And then, of course, in Congress, I recently tallied it up, Elaine, nine members of Congress over the past six months have lost their jobs over sexual harassment. Uh, at one point in December, three members of Congress lost their jobs in one week. Historians wow. tell me something like that hasn't happened since slavery. Wow. Um, well, Amber, you mentioned off the top that many states are dusting off the laws that they had on the books. Did most states actually have, though, explicit, spelled out harassment policies, sexual harassment policies prior to the Me Too movement? Yeah, it depends what you mean or how you define, I should say, explicit and spelled out. Uh, analysts, nonpartisan analysts tell me that most states had some kind of perfunctory rule that said sexual harassment is bad, don't do it. Uh, but at least a third of states did not require any training whatsoever on what sexual harassment actually means. Of course, in Congress, uh, this year is the first time in its history in both chambers that lawmakers will have to go through similar training. So a lot of these rules really seemed written by uh, people and lawmakers inclined to sort of appease the lawyers, say, OK, we have this down that sexual harassment is bad, rather than make it easier for victims to be able to report it. Well, does it seem like Congress will update its own policies this year? I have struggled trying to figure that out. The House passed something in February that a lot of advocates praised to make it easier uh, for people not in power to, of course, challenge people in power they feel are, are treating them improperly. That bill is stalled in the Senate, and I can't quite figure out why. It just seems like it's not a priority for some reason. Uh, of course, there have been less senators who have lost their jobs or been accused than there have been members in the House uh, in the broader Me Too movement. Uh, but I cannot figure out why this bill is solved in the Senate when it seems like across the country, lawmakers agree that it's a politically smart thing to do to update their policies. Yeah, because the national conversation about the Me Too movement certainly is not, you know, anywhere close to being over. And I wonder, are lawmakers facing pressure in any way to get this done? Absolutely, they are. I think that's one reason you and I are sitting here talking about the unprecedented number of changes in state legislatures to sexual harassment policies. Lawmakers didn't look at this last year or the year before because they didn't feel compelled to by public sentiment. And the Me Too movement has changed that in a very drastic way. Um, of course, the big outstanding question is, as you pointed out, is what will Congress do, if anything?
Well, so a record number of women are running for Congress this year. Many picked up nominations in primaries earlier this week. Do advocates see the potential of more women in office as a good thing when it comes to fighting harassment? Yeah, absolutely. Advocates are very excited about the thought of more women in power. That's not to say women haven't been accused of sexual harassment in the Me Too era, because that has happened. But the majority of those accused and who have lost their jobs have been men. And the majority of these rules were written by what best can be described as kind of an old boys club looking out for themselves. But a lot of these women who are running, and it is a record number at all levels of government, anywhere you look, need to win first. And, and advocates are very cautious about whether they can actually win at record levels. It's not because women can't uh, win races at the same rate as men. It's just that a lot of these women are in primaries against each other. Or in the case of this week, a lot of these women were Democrats who won their primaries in very Republican states. So that record number could dwindle by the time we get to November and on Election Day. But more women in power, advocates tell me, is a very positive thing for the Me Too movement. Nevertheless, still baffling as to why you say this legislation has stalled in the United States Senate, considering, as I said, this ongoing national conversation that's taking place on this issue. Amber Phillips, I know you'll continue to watch it. Thanks so much, Amber. Thank you.